Good morning, everyone. Let us all rise for worship. We love you, God. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I know who I am. I know who I am. No.
sing too loud, I'm going to crack. So can you help me out with this one? Let me get some more tea. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more. Your turn. Okay, I hear about five of us. Come on. Oh, he's faithful. So why in the world would he fail? Everybody said he won't. But he won't. I still got joy. I still got joy in chaos. That makes no sense, so I won't be. I'm not held. Hallelujah to that. Cause I built my life on Jesus. And he's never let me. So I Come on and shout it real big. My legs are working just fine. Come on. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Say he won't. Oh, our trust is in you. to your unchanging hands. For you are the same yesterday, a hundred years ago, today, and forever. So God, we can cling onto you. Hallelujah. It says, rain came and the winds blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm dying with who? It's that simple. Can we say rain? Rain in the wind. Build it on a firm foundation. One more time, say rain. Foundation of Christ and I Can we say it again? I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. Cause I'm standing strong on you. And I'm gonna make it. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Come on, crisis. Christ is Peace be 
our God will never leave. He won't. He won't Last time say, Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand when everything Daniel, 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 we are almost through our sermon series on Daniel. We have one more week after this week, and this week we have finally gotten to the famous lion's den. Now, I know half of you, when we started the sermon series on Daniel, thought this was the first story because this was really the only one you knew out of the book of Daniel, um, but it's actually the last narrative part of the story. This is the end, the kind of culmination of a decades-long story that's been told about Daniel. And next week, as we're going to get into it, it gets weird. And it gets weird because it goes through Daniel's dreams. All the dreams are put together in four chapters at the very end. And it's everything from future prophecy to end times to we're going to see some beasts and some dragons and some crazy things. Uh, so we're doing all of that next week. Daniel's dreams, the last four chapters of the book. Uh, but this week, this is the last story that's just like a normal story that ends kind of the narrative portion of the book. And this is when Daniel is 80 years old. So let's do a brief recap. Daniel was one of the people of God who was brought into exile when he was a young man, let's say 10 or 12. He was of a noble house in Israel. And so when uh, Babylon came and they took the southern kingdom into exile. They took some of the children from the noble houses to raise in the Babylonian court. So with this first wave of exile, Daniel was one of these young men who was taken to the Babylonian court, expected to become Babylonian, and he, in his heart of hearts, decided he was going to remain faithful to the God of Israel. And so we have this whole book, six chapters so far, written about how Daniel remains faithful to the God of Israel um, by refusing to eat... Um, uh, unclean food, by refusing to pray to another God, all these different ways, all these different stories that we've seen. And God protects Daniel and God promotes Daniel to where he be, has a place of prominence in the kingdom. Um, now, the, the second primary storyline that's been happening is the king at the time and God's effort to reach out to, to get in touch with to make contact with and to kind of draw into relationship the king of Babylon at the time. And so we saw God's efforts at reaching out to Nebuchadnezzar, and then we saw God's efforts at reaching out to Belshazzar last week. And then last week ended with this turn of the empires, and the new emperor who came up was Darius of the Medo-Persian Empire. I'm going to shorten that into Persian Empire. Um, but for those of you who are going to go on Jeopardy later, you need to know that it's, it was actually the Medo Persian Empire. So Darius, the uh, emperor, the king of the Persian Empire, is now in charge. It's a new empire, and Daniel's still here. <laughs> Daniel's still here. And because Daniel was um, 
was great and was wise and was good at his job, he then gets put into prominence in this new empire, in this new court, and that's where we pick up today. So if you look at Daniel chapter 6, you have the story of Darius coming into power. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps stationed throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, including Daniel. So he's basically dividing up the enormous kingdom that he has conquered. So he's got these different, um, let's call them district superintendents. And then over them, he has three different governors or presidents. And one of those three is Daniel. So Daniel has an extraordinary amount of power. Um, and he has an extraordinary amount of influence. Soon, Daniel distinguished himself above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to point him over the whole kingdom. So the presidents and the satraps tried to find grounds for complaint against Daniel in connection with the king, but they could find no grounds for complaint or any corruption because he was faithful and no negligence, negligence or corruption could be found in him. So he's doing his job so well, the king wants to elevate him even further. The, his, his co-workers get jealous, and they start trying to plan how to bring him down, and they can't find anything, can't find any dirt on him, because he is humble, and he is good, and he is faithful, and he is very good at his job, and so they can't find anything he has done wrong. And so they start thinking, if we're going to bring him down, the only thing, it's going to have to be something having to do with his God. Because that's the only thing we can find that he's not going to budge on. we got to find something that's going to have to do with his God. So they came to Darius, and this was the speech. O oh, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, and the governors all agree that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an uh, edict that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. So here's the plan. They come to the king, and they say, king, you are great. You know how great you are? You are so great that everyone should pray to you as a god. Because you know what? You are a god. And you know what? You should make it punishable by death if people don't pray to you as a god. And for your typical world leader with a generous-sized ego, this sounds pretty good, right? And so Darius hears this. He thinks this sounds very reasonable. He writes the edict. And when you write the edict, as they say, the, wor the wording that's used in here in the... Um, by the order of the Medes and the Persians, it can't be revoked. So once it's, once it's written, it can't be revoked. And so it's written, it's proclaimed. And remember, this is just 30 days. This is one month. So literally, the only thing Daniel has to do to get away from this is stop praying for one month. Some of us don't even need a threat to do that, right? Some of us don't need a lion's den. We just need, like, children's sports or something else in our calendar, all Daniel has to do is stop praying for 30 days. But we know Daniel by this point, right? Daniel's not going to make a fuss. He's not going to go demand the king revoke the order. He's not even going to complain. He's just going to quietly keep doing what he's always been doing. Right? This is the Daniel we met last, last week. This is Daniel at the end of his life who made a decision very early in his life, and he's not wavered from that decision. I made that decision a long time ago, and so I know now who I am, and I know what I'm going to do. And that's the Daniel who shows up now. He's in his 80s. He has been praying every day, multiple times a day. And there's not any edict from the king of the Medo-Persian Empire that is going to change it. And so here's what happens. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room open toward Jerusalem. And to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to God and praise him, just as he'd done previously. Now, what I love about Daniel is he doesn't like, he doesn't make a fuss about it, right? He's just doing what he's always done. 
So it's not like he goes, this is, this is not necessarily like an act of civil disobedience. It's not like he goes and prays in front of the palace. He just keeps doing what he's always done because he knows that that's what faithfulness looks like. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and said concerning, concerning the edict, O king, did you not sign an edict that anyone who prays to anyone within 30 days except you shall be thrown into a lion's den? The king answered, Yes, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they said to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. He is praying his prayers three times a day. And that's when the king realizes that his ego has trapped him. Because his ego has gotten in him to a place where he can't revoke this law anymore. He has said anyone who prays to anyone else is going to be thrown in the lion's den, and he can't change it. So uh, when the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel. And until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. But the conspirators came to him and said, you know what? You know, O, o king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. And the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of the Lord's, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then he went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no food and drink was brought to him, and slept, sleep fled from him. Okay, we're going to pause there for a second. Because I want to unpack a little bit about what's happening in this story, especially what's happening in the story read at the tail end of all of these other stories. Now, the, the dominant characters that we've heard in this story are Daniel, of course, and then the jealous accusers, the other presidents. But then there's Darius. And just like the rest of the stories, the king plays a prominent role in the story. The king is one of the major characters. In fact, if we were tracing back the book, we would say that the major character of the first couple of chapters was Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. And then it was Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then it was Belshazzar and Daniel. The kings play an important role in the story because the kings are teaching us something about the way people respond to God and the way people interact with the God of Israel, right? So this whole, this whole story has been set where God has put his agents into the Babylonian empire and then tried to get to the Babylonian king by sending messages, by sending dreams. And then we saw the change in the empire, and now we see Darius, Darius, who is also being wooed by God. And so if we're thinking about where we see ourselves in this story, so many times we see ourselves in the story only as the Daniel, only as the Shadrach and the Meshach and Abednego. But if you look at the way the story is presented, really we should also see ourselves every now and then as the king. As the king, as the one who is listening to God or not listening to God, who is making this choice whether to follow God or not follow God. And in this story, that becomes particularly evident because the normal reaction reading the story is to feel kind of sorry for Darius, right? Darius likes Daniel. Darius, the king, keeps trying to save Daniel. But Darius finds himself tricked by accusers into a place where he has to do what he never wanted to do. Um, and so he throws Daniel into the lion's den and seals the den with a rock. Now, the thing we need to notice about Darius is, first of all, the only reason he got himself in that place to begin with was because he didn't think twice about worshiping himself right? This has been one of the big themes of Daniel. God is God, you are not. God is God, we are not. Every time we put ourselves on our own throne, we get in trouble. And Darius, the, again, the king of the most powerful empire in the world, didn't think twice about a command to worship him as God. And he didn't think there would be any repercussion to that that he wasn't okay with, right? He didn't think there would be any consequence to the choice of worshiping himself and commanding everyone else to worship him as God. 
But because there were others who did not have his best interest in mind, he found himself backed into a corner. Okay, so here's the first thing I want to bring out. You in your heart of hearts very, very often tell yourself that there is no consequence to worshiping yourself as God. You in your heart of hearts very often tell yourself. This whole series, we've been talking about the struggle, about being on the throne of your life and then the humility it takes to get off the throne of your life, right? You being the center of the universe and the humility and the repentance that it takes to step out of being the center of your own universe and put God on the throne of your life and put God in charge of everything you do and have all of your energy not pointed toward yourself glory, but pointed toward the glory of God. Those decisions about who is on the throne of our life are decisions that come up a thousand times a day in tiny, tiny ways. And because we live in this kind of in-between world where the darkness and the light are still warring with each other, there are so many times in which we think that the choice to put myself on the throne just this one time is going to have no consequences. It's going to have no consequences. It's going to hurt nobody. It's just me. I'm only making this decision for me. And the, it, the, the image that we're seeing in this book that gets played out is that that never works that way. That never works that way. Who we worship and how we live always has repercussions, always affects the people around us, always has consequences, most of which we find disagreeable when we finally get pressed up against them. And so Darius here is playing the part of the everyman who thinks it innocuous to choose to worship himself and yet finds that there is death waiting at the end of that journey. And if you take that a step further and you start playing through the symbolism, you find something pretty interesting. So when the early Christians preached this text, they saw this story, and this is one of the reasons it became one of the most famous for Christians, they saw this story awash in symbolism because they saw in the person of Daniel a pre-symbol, prefiguration of the person of Christ, of the person of Christ. The accusers were trying to get Darius And so the accusers backed him into a corner. And Darius' own sin brought about the point that there was going to be somebody killed. And so Darius threw Daniel into the lion's den. And then what happened? They rolled a stone over the den and they sealed it overnight. It's the same words. Jesus was crucified and laid in a tomb and they rolled a stone over the tomb, and they sealed it. That's that's intentional on somebody's part. It's the same image. It's the same same words used. But then what happened after that? When they opened the the tomb, when they opened the den expecting only death, what they find is that God has prevailed. And so when the tomb is opened and the stone is rolled away, and we expect only a dead body. What we find instead is the resurrected glory that has begun the new creation. And when the, when the stone is lifted off the tomb, what we find instead of death is that God has brought life from death. In fact, Daniel's words, when you read later in the chapter, is that Daniel, God protected me because I am innocent of transgression. And the early Christians reading that would have said, nobody is innocent of transgression, only Christ. Only Christ. And so because Christ, who was innocent, went into the tomb, life has won. And the fascinating part of the end of, of the end of the story of Daniel is what happens, at, and this part does not get taught to the children usually. What happens at the end is the bad guys get thrown into the lion's den, right? We, we, we skip that part with the children. The bad guys get thrown into the lion's den. And the Christians looked at that and they said, you know what? The accusers got the punishment that they wanted for the children of God. Those who accused Daniel, that is the accuser, the great enemy, 
the spiritual forces of wickedness and death that come against humanity, those were the ones that were finally committed to death. And the one that had made the choice was saved. Not because he earned it, not because he deserved it, but because God found a way when his choices, in fact, led to death. And so what we see in the early Christian preaching of this story is a symbol of Christ that leads to this, oh, this, this message of grace, right? Because you know what Darius deserved? Darius deserved to go to that tomb, to go to that den, and to find it full of blood and bones, right? That's what Darius deserved, and yet what he got by the grace of God was he got a person who had been preserved, who had been kept. He got life instead of death. And we come to the image of Christ, what we have is a whole lot of people who freely made the choices and deserved only death, and yet because of the grace of God and because of what God did, were given life. The reason this is important, the reason this story is at the end tale of the narrative, is that this whole series we have been hitting very, very, very hard to the point that some of you have told me how hard we've been hitting it, our part in the life of faith, right? Our role. And I have not minced words because this book has not minced words. Our role is important. Our agency is important. Our choices are important. But you know what? At the end of the day, because you are human, there's going to come a time when you fail. At the end of the day, because you are human, there's going to become a time when you are not Daniel in the story, you're Nebuchadnezzar. Or Belshazzar. At the end of the day, because you are human, Whatever we aspire to, and we should aspire to so much, whatever we aspire to, we're going to fail. There's going to come a time when we fail. There's going to come a time when you make a choice and you look back and you realize that that choice was for death. There's going to come a time when you look around you and you realize that you've just hurt some of the people who mean the most to you in the world. There's going to come a time when whatever your aspirations are, you completely screw them up. And you know what happens then, as the Christians say, is that that is where we meet the grace of God. That is where we meet the grace of God. Because if we were reliant on our own faithfulness to acquire the life that God has offered us, none of us would make it. If, we were, if it was expected of all of us to be like Daniel, in order to acquire, achieve this resurrection, we'd be lost. Because in your heart of hearts, there are some days you're Daniel and there are some days you're Nebuchadnezzar and it's a toss up which one is which. But if it was required of you to be Daniel every single day, friends, we would all of us be lost. And that is why we don't have to be. That is why we were never meant to be. That is why Jesus came. And that is why the beginning point of this whole Christian journey is grace. This sermon has to be preached in conjunction with all the other sermons because even as we preach the importance of faithfulness, friends, if you idolize your own righteousness, you will find yourself walking away from the faith because the day is going to come when you're not righteous. If you idolize your own faithfulness, you're going to find yourself walking away from the faith because you'll have nothing to do on the days you fall. And you're going to fall. You're going to mess up. You're going to make choices that in your best intentions, never met the consequences they led to. And that's where you find Jesus. That's where you find Jesus. So listen, we are about to, we've got one more sermon in the series, and it's weird and fun. We're going through all of Daniel's dreams. But after that, we get into Lent. And in Lent, we are going to really dive deep into the story of Jesus as presented in the Gospel of Luke and to the invitation of Jesus to follow and the invitation of Jesus to walk in the path that he leads and to serve and to love and to become a disciple. And we're going to dig deep into that. And so to start that journey and to end this one, this is where we stand. Everything comes back to grace. Everything comes back to grace. If you are at the beginning of your faith journey, and you've never done anything before, the first thing you do is you just ex ex receive the grace. If you are years into your faith journey and you are overcome with how much it within you has not yet been changed by the grace of God, 
then all we do is we receive the grace. Wherever you are in your faith journey, it all comes back to this. Because you are not able, and because I am not able, and because none of us are able, Christ is. And because Christ is, then we who deserve only death have been given life. We who deserve only death have been given life. We who deserve only death have been given life. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, you, you are good. You know us better than we know ourselves. You call us into a deeper relationship with you, and you call us into a greater experience with you. And you call us into so many ways that our lives can be different and more full if only we would heed your call. And God, we give you all that we have. We give you our energy and we give you our time and we give you our, our intention and we give you our faithfulness. And God, we also confess that we are never going to do it perfectly. And so God, give us the humility to repent where we need, to turn when we need. Give us the humility to accept the grace and forgiveness that you offered. That by allowing that grace within us, we might receive the life that you won for us on Calvary. Come, Holy Spirit, break open the hearts that are before you. Break open the hearts that are bound by fetters of shame. Break open the hearts that are bound by fetters of unbelief. Break open the hearts that are in front of you and fill them with yourself, that as your Holy Spirit moves, we might be changed. This we pray as we say together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For then is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is where the baton passes to you. This is the part we call the offering. And here at Westminster, for us, offering is all of us. It's your prayers and your presence and your gifts and your service and your witness. And so you've got two minutes to offer your heart back to God. You can come up here and kneel and pray if you'd like to. You can stay in your seat and pray if you'd like to. If you've got a tangible gift, we've got a clear box in the back. You can also give online at wumc.com. But however you want to give, this is your two minutes before the noise starts again and before the life starts again to offer yourself back to the God who offered all of himself to you. Though the earth may pass away, your 
be seated. We've just got a few announcements before we end our time of worship together. Uh, first of all, this is the brochure I was talking about. This is the Wednesday night series. Uh, if you grab one of these, you can open it to find information about every single session. And you can also sign up uh, by filling out the form that's in this brochure. You can also sign up online. Uh, grab one on your way out and sign up this week. Okay, coming up, we have Lenten devotionals. Donate your extra Bibles. We still have this drive going if you've got any extra Bibles. Um, we are going to be ending that soon, but we will get them to people who can use them if you've got extra Bibles lying around your house. Lenten devotionals. Um, Jesus wants you to do this. So we, we, we email out devotionals during Advent and during Lent, and it's always, we, we need what? We have 10 spots. It's always very difficult to get people to sign up. And then when people actually write them, I get so much amazing feedback. Um, I've had so many people, you know, during Advent, I literally got emails every single day saying how meaningful they were. It's just telling your story and giving a few thoughts about a scripture. And so I know, I know you see this and you're like, I can't do this. Uh, yes, you can. You can. You do not have to have a PhD in theology. You do not have to be a teacher. It's just a faith story and um, a thought about Luke. Uh, two of our youth have signed up to write devotionals. So if you're smarter than a 12-year-old, you can do this. Um, we've got 10 more spots. You can go and tell, talk to Casey afterwards. She can help you do it or help you um, tell you how to do it. You can also use your connection card and sign up online. Okay. Lenten devotionals, Ash Wednesday. This is February 22nd. The beginning of Lent is marked by Ash Wednesday. Uh, this is a very, very old tradition. And actually, I'm gonna talk about it that night. Uh, traditionally, we burn the palms from Palm Sunday and use the ashes for Ash Wednesday. And there's a whole lot of beautiful symbolism in there. But what it does is it marks the beginning of the season of Lent, which is a season where we think about uh, what we, we still need to repent of, what we still need to change, where Christ has not yet gotten in and, and finished his work of new creation and, and redemption within us. And so it's a season of repentance and of prayerfulness and of contemplation. And we start that with Ash Wednesday. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to be there. You can either do a come and go during the lunch hour. It'll be in the sanctuary, or you can come to our regular service. It'll be 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. Um, and that is it. My friends, receive these words of blessing as you go out into the week. 
my brothers and sisters, go in grace. Go in love and go in peace and go in hope and go in joy. And this morning especially, go in grace. Go knowing that the grace of God is so much bigger than you are. Go knowing that the love of God is so much greater than you are. And go knowing that you are held in the presence of God and the love of God and the power of Christ wherever you go. And so may that presence go within you. Wherever you walk this week, go in blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.